Welcome to the Mount Pleasant Magazine podcast, featuring discussions and interviews about the people, places, and events that make Mount Pleasant such a special place. Hi, this is Roger Gaither, your host for the Mount Pleasant Magazine podcast. Today, Bill Maschio, publisher of Mount Pleasant Magazine, chats with Jimmy Carroll, owner of Carroll Realty and the mayor of the Isle of Palms. Now, here are Bill and Jimmy. Here we are with another episode of Mount Pleasant podcast, and I've, I've got to tell you, Jimmy, we're, we're Jimmy Carroll here, the mayor of, of Isle of Palms. Jimmy, thanks for joining us, man. Glad to be here, Bill. You and I have been together for a long time. How long has it been? I was just telling uh, Roger, our producer, that it's at least 40 years. Or, at least you know, 40 years. At least 40 years. But you know, Jimmy, this is called the Mount Pleasant po- Magazine podcast, but uh, you know, the islands, are, Mount Pleasant is what it is today, partially because of the proximity to the Isle of Palms and Sullivan's Island. And that's why I wanted to bring you on, not only so you could tell us how you're, how you're doing on, you know, on the Isle of Palms with being mayor and everything, but people need to understand that Mount Pleasant is what it is today, partially because of the proximity. Don't you agree with that? I think we're also interrelated. It's unbelievable. You know, when my parents moved here in the late fifties and the Navy was brought them down here, said that, you know, y'all need to live in North Charleston or Hanahan, close to the Navy base. And they had heard about all palms and Sullivan's own. And they came out here the very next day and ended up in an apartment. And there was 300 people out here. Nobody wanted to live on the beaches back in those days. Right, uh, right. Sullivan's Island was predominantly Navy Yard people. Um, Isle Palms was uh, a mixture of Navy Yard and Navy base. I mean, but it was not the resort you see today. Tell people about you, Jimmy. People don't know about you. Tell, tell us about your boys. Uh, tell us about you, if you don't mind, a little introduction. I was not born here. I was born in Baltimore, Maryland. My mother met my father when he was teaching up in Annapolis. And I was brought here as a baby. And uh, moved on 22nd Avenue on Isle Palms and upstairs in the apartment. Back in those days, the Navy used to send people out for a year, two years at a time. So my dad was gone most of the time. Um, But it was kind of like Andy of Mayberry growing up. I mean, there was nothing out here. There was no Hartnett Boulevard, no avenues, no Waterway Boulevard, no Wild Dunes. Um, the end of Isle Palms was at 37th Avenue, which is six months later, my mom bought a house down at 37th Avenue. Wow. And so, you know, it was pretty cool to have grown up in an area and watch it grow up around you. Absolutely. And and how many boys? You got three boys. Tell us about your boys, Jimmy, because I know how proud you are. Yeah, I've got three do. sons. And, um, you know, the oldest is, um, God, how old is he? He's 30. And then I have a 28 and a 26. The oldest has been working with the State Department. And with um, Peace Corps down in Central America um, during the COVID crisis, after his term was up in Ecuador, um, they closed that department down, the consular office. So right now he's working for ICE as an interpreter. Um, my middle son and my youngest son, middle son is Windsor. The oldest son is named Jimmy the Third. I hate okay. to do that to him. That's three generations of Jimmy Carroll's on Isle Palms. Um, the middle son is Winslow. That's a family name. And uh, he, too, is more like me. He's a chip off the old block. And uh, Capers, my youngest, is the most laid back, but, you know, nice. All three of them are as polite as they can be. Um, you know, growing up in a military family, you kind of learn to teach your kids manners as they grow up. Two of them are in real estate, right? Two of them are working under me in real estate, and uh, they're doing a good job. Um and they know that at the end of this year, when I retire, I'm going to semi-retire, I'm going to keep my license. And they are going to take care of anybody who calls for me, but they're going to be working on their own, trying to hustle some real estate. You know what, Jimmy, their intimate knowledge of the island is what the new people moving on the island want more than anything. Actually, surveys taken by the, the Realtors Association, National Realtors Association said, that uh, knowledge of the territory is is right there. It's almost even with ethical. So that's how important people feel. So the boys have that, man, because they were raised and born, you know, here on the island. They were raised, born here on the island, and, um, and truly, you know, knowledge is, is second nature to them. They know nothing but this area. I know nothing but this area. 
Real estate's been the only career I've had for the last 43 years. I thought I was going to be an attorney. I took a political science major, um, took my LSAT in 1978, got accepted to Carolina Law School. But I came into real estate that summer to give me something to do. And here I am 43 years later, hustling real estate. And I love real estate. I love being outside, talking to people, meeting people, looking at cool houses. I featured you in the latest Mount Pleasant magazine. Matter of fact, that the one behind my shoulders here is uh, is the issue. And we did the top 10 uh, most beautiful homes sold uh, or, or last year. And you were featured for 300 Ocean Boulevard. Congratulations on that, by the way. You sold the most expensive home in 2020 on the Isle of Palms. That house has been very good to me. I, I probably have sold that house. I can't remember. It's either four or five times. You know, that house, like owners, you said, the house keeps on giving. <laughs> the house that keeps on giving. I think the new owners are, are great people. They're, uh, he's a, he runs a hospital system on the West Coast, and uh, they want to kind of raise their family over here in this side of the world. So I think they're doing a lot of work to it, even though it didn't really need a lot of work, but they're making it more their custom home. Um, you, know, you know, Jimmy, one of the things I enjoy my relationship with all my realtor friends <laughs> is you get to know who's buying real estate. And we've had numerous conversations, as you know, from people that will buy on Sullivan's Island, for instance, and they'll fly out of town on a Sunday night and they'll come back on a Thursday or whatever. I mean, that's pretty fascinating. And, and by, by my, through my relationship, I found, about, I found out about all the very awesome people that actually call our islands home. Yeah. I mean, it's truly, it's, it's, when I say home, Charleston's a beautiful city. You know, Condé Nast has named this the top city destination 10 times in a row. Um, in a way, I wish they quit naming us that. Um, you know, Charleston has this, the tri counties, not just Charleston, but Charleston, Berkeley, Dorchester counties are growing at unbridled growth. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And it we is. really need to work on our infrastructure, our, our traffic, our schools to keep up with this growth. Um, you know, and here's a mayor aspect of all of this. A beach mayor aspect is okay. Our beach, that's what our, yeah. be our beaches are not growing, um, and that's one of the, the challenges that we all face. Um, we've got Isle Palm, Sullivan Island, Folly Beach, and Edisto Island, who are the beaches for these three counties. And um, in fact, last week I'd asked for a meeting. Pat O'Neill and I were talking, and when we asked for a meeting with. Mayor Will Haney and Bill Woosley over in James Island, um, the Charleston County Sheriff's Department. Uh, we met out of the, the COG, which is the um, Council of Governments for the three um, surrounding counties. Um, we had Christy Hall, the Secretary of Transportation, come down and join us. So instead of, I said, they started off saying, all right, Jim, you called for this meeting, you start it. Number one, I said, I think the U.S. government was playing a joke on us back on April 1st, 1969, when they announced the closure of the Navy base. And we all thought Charleston was going to die. And it ended up being probably one of the best things to happen to Charleston because it opened it up to all this diverse industry. And that diverse industry is causing the growth that we see today. And the quality of life here is just unparalleled. You look at the coastline of South Carolina, 187 miles, and almost two thirds of it is protected. I mean, we're surrounded. Wow, by that's eight awesome, eight. Jimmy. Yeah, Jimmy, what 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 came of the meeting? Tell us what, what came. What of the came of the meeting? That you, that you asked to have. That's cool. Yes, what came of the meeting? It was a very productive meeting. Um, instead of blaming each other, we talked about working together. Um, the COG, we asked them four years ago to create an app called the Beach Reach. Stop. You know, go to your app on your cell phone, look for Beach Reach. And they've got an app there already and has the cameras, but we're going to add one more little um, drop down and it's going to say the capacity of each beach 50% okay. full, 60% full, 70% full. And the more do we educate everybody in the tri county areas that they're going to come to the beach. They can see, well, our Palms is 80% full. It's going to take us an hour to get there. Is it really worth coming there today? Maybe we should come tomorrow or the next day. Um, but it's everybody working together. And that's what we want. We want everybody to work together, not to be blaming each other, but to work together.
Jimmy, let me ask you something. I believe communications, and obviously with that story about bringing those people together, you believe in communications too. And there was a lot of communications during COVID. Let's face it, there was. Through communications, we can learn. What is a takeaway for, for your town, for Isle of Palms? Uh, uh, what did you learn? What did the town learn during COVID? COVID, you know, was an unprecedented pandemic worldwide. Nobody knew what to do. The last time was in 1918, 1919. And, um, you know, every 100 years there's a pandemic of some sort. Um, and when the governor closed the beaches in March of last year for two months, and people were held hostage at home, and the beaches were closed, the waterways were closed, and everybody were blaming the beach mayors for doing that. Well, we do, we're not the ones who did it. You know, we're just where we live here. And so when the beaches started opening and the pandemic was in full force, you know, which there was no guidebook, there was no playbook. Nobody gave us instructions. The beach mayors met and we talked about ways we could work together to do the same thing. And all four of us ended up doing completely different ideas and not one of them really worked. I have to I have to tell you a quick story, Jimmy. I was taking some photographs and I went on to the island and I wanted to take some photographs of the sheriff and or y'all police chief, not sheriff, police chief there. And because y'all were stopping people as they came in. And I said, sir, I said, this is a positive thing. It's not a negative. I just want to report what's going on. And I said, how are you feeling about this? She says, he says, all I'm doing is protecting our residents. That's yeah, that was that was what you had to do. And that was a great comment he had. That was the whole reason for our doing that. Um, so, we were, you know, the governor said he wanted 50 percent capacity in locations. We were trying to limit the beaches to 50 percent capacity by taking away parking on one side of the street. Um, and as we did that, we saw how easy it was for people to get down Palm Boulevard. Palm Boulevard is a two lane road. It feeds to wild dunes. And so when an emergency vehicle comes down Palm Boulevard and is parking on both sides of the street, there's no place for an emergency vehicle to go. And it created a whole new discussion. So that's a, that's a benefit from COVID. It's a benefit from COVID because SCDOT jumped in there and then all this S40 bill got enacted and i mean when you deal with other beach communities tell us t tell our listeners what the commonality is for a beach community when governing that beach community most of the population in the united states are all moving to the coast and the coastline as i just said a second ago are 187 miles and two-thirds of it is protected so there's a very small amount that's actually open to residents who can get there by car. And we got the four beaches, Edisto, Bali, Sullivan's Island, and Isle Palms. That's it. Now, we do have some beautiful, pristine islands, um, Deweese Island, Capers Island, Bulls Island. Um, you know, then you get down to the Ace Basin. You go to Cape Remain National Wildlife Reserve. You go to Santee River Preserve. I mean, those are all protected areas, but they're also stunningly beautiful. So there's ways for people to get out and about to look around, but to get here easy by car, those four beach communities have to absorb everybody. And we want, it's, this is still a community. All of our beach communities are similar in that while people like to come and spend the day, most of us live here, our kids grew up here, they're playing the streets, they're in bicycles in the street, they um, walk to their rec center in the middle of all palms, and so when you get all these cars driving up and down the streets, um, it makes it dangerous. In 2015, I proposed Plan C, which was to protect the interior of Isle Palms to make it residential only for parking. And that's what we fought so hard for this past year. Um, we did a give and take with SEDOT. I credit Chris, uh, Secretary Christy Hall and city administrator uh, Desiree Fergoso in working together. Um, we added probably 30 to 40% more parking on an angle on Palm Boulevard. We tried three different things. 
Um, in the beginning, it was parking any which way. And then we did parallel parking. Um, parallel parking you know, is what SCDOT in their manual prefers. But on Highway 703, because it's so busy and it's so diverse, there's people going to the wild dunes, there's people going to their homes, there's people going to the beaches. You got people crossing the road every which location. You know, it's it's dangerous. And so parallel, you're backing out into traffic, it doesn't work. So, and before that was perpendicular parking. And that means they were really backing into um, Palm Boulevard. This angled parking that SCDOT came up with, I think really works. It's, I don't like looking at all the um, bumpers they have out there. And we're gonna change the side bumpers to a low profile next year. But right now it delineates each and every parking spot and it's working great. You can back out and you're not backing out onto the road. It's safer. And plus it gives emergency vehicles rooms go down palm boulevard cars have a way to pull over to the side which is which is really important let me ask you something jimmy what made you run i mean what's inside your your gut your head your mind your soul to make you want to run for office you know i ran for council 10 years ago um, um i was watching our palms i was watching the direction our palms was going we did a lot of smart things in 1987, we bought the 5.5 acres down at Front Beach for parking. There's not one beach community around here who went to that level to buy that much land, knowing that parking was going to be an issue in the future. And you were on city council when they bought that land. No, I was not. I was just a resident. Okay. But I mean, I can give our, our forefathers all the credit in the world for having done so. Well, that I'm sorry. That, yeah, yeah. that was brilliant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so pa park recreation tourism, they manage that? Uh, no, now they bought nine acres from the beach company, also from the beach company, after Hurricane Hugo, when Hugo took down the motor court. Remember the ghost? Right. Story? Yeah, for sure. There used to be that motor court across the street. And so all these big hotel chains want, were salivating. They wanted to buy that property and build high rise hotels there. Well, we have a 40-foot height limit on all palms, and we're not going to give that up. If 40 feet is the maximum height on all palms. And um, so for the amount of money the beach company was asking, it didn't make economic sense. So the beach company worked out a deal with Charleston County Parks Recreation and sold it to them for a good price. That I'm sure they got credits, and uh, it worked out well. I mean, so we got a, a Charleston County Park. Plus, our parking lots all there at the commercial district in our homes. That's great. Parking is definitely a, an issue with all uh, communities along the coast, for sure. Right. So, so Jimmy, what um, what's ahead? Well, yeah, like, right. let me back up for a second. You asked about yeah. why I decided. Yes, I did. So, going back to that, you know, ten years ago, I was watching our homes. I was looking at some of the decisions we were making. I mean, we had a referendum to buy that parking lot. Great. We had a referendum to buy the marina down at 41st Avenue, brilliant, to ensure that we had water access. Unfortunately, Isle Palms is not a good real estate landlord. We had no idea what we were doing. And they weren't managing it well. And when I got on council, you know, I was trying to get them to say, all right, let's look at it as a business investment. Use triple net leases down here. And we had a vote for a renewal of the lease down there, and uh, it was a 7-2 vote. I voted against the uh, lease because it should have been triple net. Because of the way it went, we're now spending $5 million down there to build new docks and everything that should have been put on the tenant. That's like, you know, I'm not, it's not spilt milk. It's just the way it is. It's that's, been be a big, that's been a big issue for your... Uh... Uh, during your tender. In, oh, absolutely. In, you know. um, but that marina is going to be beautiful within the next year. I am so proud of what we're accomplishing right now. I mean, since my being mayor, I think I've had a living hurricane for four years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I inherited a fire station that was built in 2008. That's back yeah. during the, the recession. I don't understand that. But all the repairs that has to be done. On oh, it, it cost $6.5 to build in 2008. 
and it cost us five million dollars to repair 12 years later i mean uh, that that's a disaster so we jimmy what's your what's your takeaway from being mayor tell tell just put it in condensed words like what what as somebody that loves you, you have such high passion for your island, for Isle of Bombs. Um, what's there's your takeaway? People, there's a lot of people who want to run for mayor, and I hope they all run for mayor for the right reasons. For right. the same reason I ran for it, which is the love of Isle of Bombs, for the for the love for our residents of Isle of Bombs. There's right. Nothing I'm gaining as being mayor in Isle of Bombs. In fact, if anything, it's hurt my business being mayor because it takes a lot of time. Luckily, I've been here long enough and I deal in really the upper end properties um, that you know, I still make money. But for people who are running just because they want a title and not invest the time, that doesn't work. Right. I've, I've been involved in so many things being mayor. I've, I've fought offshore drilling, went before Congress subcommittee in Washington opposing offshore drilling. Um, we were the first to ban plastic single-use plastic bags that's great plastic cigarette smoking on the beach um you know the can people be fine can people be fine if they get caught smoking cigarette on the beach they they can but the problem is is can we have police all over the beach walk looking for that we're not gonna really do you think our beaches on the isle of palms have 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 been cleaner as a result absolutely I think the, the plastic bands, the cigarette bands, the vol- no drinking on the beach bands. You know, at first I was totally against the non drinking on the beach. I mean, come on. Uh, uh-huh. That's an American right. But it, in the right time. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the mayor saying that's an American right to drink a beer well, on the you beach? Know, <laughs> it, but, you know, I don't even drink. So here I'm saying that. But at the same time, you know, it's a it's a public beach. Right. And I got some you. people abuse it. In fact, we just had an incident a week ago where a, a graduating class was down on the beach and lots of heavy intoxication, lots of bad things going on. And, and that's all the more reason to reason yes. why we should not have drinking. Well, look at folly. What happened? Let me, oh, I'm going to, I want to close this out. Um, and I, and I want to ask you a question and I'm not asking you this question to, um, to bring tears to your eyes. I just know how important and what a special relationship you have with your mom. But if you could have a conversation right now with your mom, yeah, what, would she mom. Say, what would she say to you about your being mayor? Bill, I'm sitting here at my office at Breach Inn, and I'm looking out the window besides over the computer here, and I see him and Creek. Mom and dad are spread right there. When I die, I'm going to be spread right there. So you feel they're right with you all the time? All the time. That's awesome. And my mother, as you know, um, in fact, you came to her when she was on her deathbed. And I, I thank you so much for doing that. I got a picture of you there. Um, she meant a lot to me. She, my father was not, we got along, but he wasn't there all the time. Mom was the backbone to held the family together. Uh, she Your mom did, was very, very special person, Jimmy. She ran the recreation center. She drove a school bus. She um, worked as a secretary for a real estate company and later got a real estate license. And then in 78, when I got my license, uh, we worked for one company and then we worked for another company. And within three years, we started our own company over on Sullivan's. Island. I so, always I always pictured. Yes, I remember that company. Actually, I I, uh, I I feel your mom wasn't only your mom, but she was your mentor. She was my mentor. Absolutely. She was. She mm-hmm. taught me fiscal responsibility. She taught me how. I'm tight with a dollar. God darn am I tight with a dollar. I know, Jimmy. I've sold you advertising before. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jimmy, you know, thanks for joining us here, man, on my Pleasant Magazine podcast. It means a lot to have a conversation with you, and I hope that people learn about you through the words you've said here. And it's just been a pleasure knowing you all your life, or all my, since I've been here since 79, Jimmy. It really has. Bill, likewise, you and I have grown up together, and we refuse to grow up, I hope. Um, but yes. our you're, you're, are, when you re- when you retire you're going to be on a uh, you got an airstream or a motorhome I, I bought a small 25 foot tipping rv motorhome on a mercedes uh chassis and i'm gonna pull the motorcycle behind it and my wife and i are gonna go cross country and rediscover america that's great thanks jimmy for being here on, All right, Bill, on my pleasant you. magazine podcast thanks right, jimmy brother. be well thank you thank you bye 
Thanks for spending your time with the Mount Pleasant Magazine podcast, your community, your podcast. Listen to past and future episodes at mountpleasantpodcast.com.